uh, other verticals as well. And I'm really pleased to have uh, Tony Ambrosa, Chief Brand Officer uh, at Carhartt, but I'll, I'll let you, uh, you know, introduce yourself. If there's anything else sure. you want to add? Well, just uh, good afternoon to, to everybody out there. And, and obviously, uh, if you'd asked me a year ago if I would be having this conversation with you, Eric, I would have called you crazy. And uh, <laughs> uh, at least having a conversation like this. Uh, but here we are one year later, and you know, I, I have to say uh, thank you to everyone out there that's continued to make this possible for uh, the brands and businesses and, and really for all of us. So, uh, yeah, well, thanks yeah. to everyone. Yeah, and it's great, it's great to still have these conversations. I guess under normal circumstances, we'd be in person, uh, which would be nice. Uh, but, we, you know, we all adapt. And, and speaking of which, you know, this past year, uh, I think we've seen incredible innovation across every industry. I think uh, Tony and I were talking earlier and I, I, I was explaining like getting, going to a doctor remotely and getting a blood test in my neighborhood and like how it just, everything is so efficient now. Uh, they text, they got, I got a text when it was time to come in. So I spent very little time there. Um, and, and I think, you know, certainly in retail, I think we've seen this you know, really accelerate. Like retail has been disrupted by innovation for many years pre-pandemic. Uh, but then I think uh, some people have said sort of, uh, you know, COVID was sort of like the chief innovation officer in a way, uh, <laughs> because it sort of forced people to, you know, for survival to adapt. And so, you know, along those lines, uh, you know, maybe you could talk a little about a little bit about Carhartt and just some of the the innovation uh, that's been expedited in this past year and some of the things that, that you've done uh, to adjust to keep, you know, people safe and as well as your business uh, healthy. Sure, sure. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, no, at Carhartt, I have the pleasure of also leading our direct to consumer business as well as the brand direction and all of the communication functions that roll into it. And we, uh, we immediately, uh, all of us started to shift and think differently and, and change what we were trying to do and how we were operating. Uh, but we also had to navigate the reality that our stores were closing for a period of time. And we entered really that March, April, May window not knowing what the future really looked like, but we immediately started to receive signals from consumers that the future was going to be very digital and the future was going to remove friction. And it was gonna be on us and all of our great retail partners out there as well to figure out how we could basically take our three-year technology roadmap and get it done in about six months. <laughs> and, and, I, and I know we're not alone in that you know, challenge as well, but as, as everyone has said, yeah, the pandemic supercharged the consumer's adoption of digital. And nowadays, I think, I think one of the phrases I saw recently was hybrid shopping, which is, the, which is the simple idea that a lot of the shopping is happening digitally. Now, they may be transacting physically, whether it's a buy online pickup in store or a curbside pickup, or they're just going into the store, but you're seeing them convert at higher rates. And also the market basket size is growing as well. So we had to shift quickly and, and really ramp up the work that we were doing to accelerate some of the services we provided directly. And a lot of that turned into curbside pickup uh, solutions uh, with our retail stores, because we're about to, like there's a team, they've been working through this entire pandemic harder than ever to keep up with the consumer adoption rate because our traffic has been climbing on average 50, 60, 70% higher each day versus the prior year. And it continues to trend in that direction for us. So we're very fortunate to be seeing that type of traffic to car.com. But at the same time, we're about to launch a brand new website, brand new platform, entirely new experience. Uh, the over, our company is going to be launching a new ERP system as well. And, and the whole effort has been around streamlining and removing friction from that consumer shopping experience. So we had to come up with temporary solutions in 2020 to really meet the consumer where they were at. And then we're continuing to accelerate that as we look at 21. But also we had so many retail partners that shifted so quickly to curbside, to buy online, pick up and store to local delivery. And they were able to maintain their business and really continue to serve you know, the essential workers. And the good fortune of being a workwear brand is that so many of the people who buy Carhartt absolutely need it for the jobs that they were still pursuing and doing. Because most of those folks weren't weren't shifting to a virtual work environment like we are, right? Where we're having all these video conferences, they're actually still having to engage in the real world to accomplish and do their jobs and to keep the economy going. So a ton of innovation, a ton of acceleration. And we were also though, we had the very good fortune of so much of our, uh, you know, basically our technology roadmap 
was already moving in this direction, we've yep. just accelerated. You know, we're going to we're going to hire, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 people all in pursuit of digital acceleration across all of our businesses, direct to consumer, as well as our wholesale and what we call our CCG business, which is basically outfitting work crews in a single uniform program as well. Got it. That, well, you know, along those lines, like you, you mentioned that you, you run your direct to consumer business, but there, there's still a retail business. You said a whole, you mentioned a wholesale, so you, you have channel partners. So, you know, how has, how in the past year, how have these complemented each other uh, and, and influenced your roadmap? Yeah. You know, the, the simplest way to think about it is like a investment portfolio, right? So when we think about the different businesses we have, and we have a business in uh, Europe as well. So what, when we first started to ramp down and shut, you know, and we, we knew we were going to have to pull back, we, we didn't see a lot of revenue coming in from our wholesale business for, for the immediate future, but we were able to offset it to the, to the best of our ability, not dollar for dollar by any stretch, because we're still not at that stage yet, but our direct to consumer business ramped up and that was providing important cash flow to continue to support the operation. So we could keep all of our associates employed and really continue to do what we could to protect them and, and do right by them. As our um, wholesale marketplace started to steady itself, in addition to some of our e-commerce only pr uh, partners out there, we really started to see them ramp up all of these solutions. And it really did a great job of helping us balance and navigate during the pandemic, all of the uncertainty that we were experiencing because the consumer was able to find card on their terms still. And, and really of the two legs of the stool that were were incredible were, were, was the wholesale and the e-commerce D2C business. Um, but our, our uniform business actually then started to ramp up as well. And that's something that we certainly, you know, benefited from down the stretch as we looked at Q3, Q4, you know, during the, the pandemic, because companies were coming online, they were needing that gear, they were needing to continue to outfit their associates and employees. So, but think about it is, you know, it's really like a portfolio and, yep. You know, one can go up while the other to offset the other. And we had the good fortune of having that ability to do that early on. But then we started to see each of the business units start to stabilize. And we and now we've really been able to see how we can lean into the needs of the marketplace and the consumer and navigate this uncertainty in 21 yeah. and beyond. Yeah, understood. And and I like that analogy, the portfolio and, and the different groups and you know, along those lines, you, I, you know, it's clear that you have a sort of sense of who your customer is and a segment, you know, and there's a segmentation schema. Yeah. And so, you know, how do you, when you have these different channels in different places, you know, how do you break down your different customer groups? How do you sort of connect them? Are they potentially customers in different places? Um, maybe different identifiers uh, and then understand who they are holistically and then be able to sort of segment them. So message appropriately. Uh, and then find find more of them, right? So if yeah. you could just talk to that. A little yeah. Bit. Well, I would say I would say that's a continuous work in work in progress, right? So so that feedback loop's always happening. So we have three primary consumer segments that we've identified, and the, and they're really uh, mindsets with need states. You know, what are what are those need states they have for the types of products and services we provide? So within those three segments, we look at those need states and how we can tap into them and really support them from a brand and a product standpoint. And then at that next level, we look at our business units and we ask ourselves, okay, how are we best positioned to reach and service these consumer segments with what retail channels? So within our wholesale portfolio, the channels that we can reach the consumer through that portfolio, through D2C, who are those primary consumer audiences? So we have first party data that allows us to better understand the people that visit us directly. And that gives us a clear view into these segments and, and, and really they're there are additional segments as well, but they're just not primary segments that we're pursuing for long-term you know, viable growth. But that gives us a very clear read then on the audiences and how we're progressing towards our goals. And then with CCG, it's slightly different, right? Because you're dealing with a decision maker that isn't always the um, end user or wearer of the product, right? So that really comes down to the strength that you have with these audiences and their influence on that decision maker. Um, so. When you boil it all down, though, we, we do. We start with the consumers. Our, our corporate strategic plan is very clear. We're going to grow into the future in two critical ways with our consumer segments and the growth that we have there, and we're prioritizing them. And that then leads to the prioritization of resources across business units and strategies, and then removing friction from the overall experience. And that's an internal friction and an external friction. 
right? Because we have to be able to continue to provide them the services and experiences and products on their terms. And, and we don't think anybody's going back to a world where they want more friction back into their shopping experience, right? They've all become very accustomed to the convenience of being able to leverage digital tools to know exactly what you're getting before you go into a store. Right. Yeah, a a absolutely. That's, that's interesting insight that you that people are now shopping online, but then they're they're not necessarily purchasing online. They're still maybe coming in, yeah. uh, but it's it's more frictionless. It's quicker. I think you mentioned the shopping carts are are larger now, uh, yeah, so they're yeah. doing a lot of research. You know, they're not browsing as much, uh, which is which is you know interesting to think about. Uh, well, we're we're seeing that just in our own retail stores, our own brick and mortar, and then with our partner accounts. Our traffic is actually um, back up year on year. You know, pre-pandemic, so those first uh, really two and a half months, Jan, Feb, and the first couple of weeks of March, we were experiencing a return of uh, uh, increased number of, of shoppers. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing as well is they're coming in ready to buy. So right. very high conversion rates. They absolutely know what they're looking for. They walk in the store. They get what they're looking for. They go to the cash register, and they're on their way. Yeah, I, I mean, how many, I'm sure it's very applicable to other industries, how many of us now, uh, if we're going to pick up lunch, you know, we order we order it uh, in advance, and then we just go in and grab it. It's so much easier. Why did we ever wait online before? It's sort of well, like, well, it's like your doctor appointment, right? Who has to waste time now in the in the lounge waiting for the doctor? You could, right. you could, you could wait at home, and then they ping you online. So. Right, or you, you know, they text you when it's time to come in. You can go get a cup of coffee. You don't have to sit there in the, you know, the Even waiting better. room with, with sick people. Uh, yeah. So it's, it is, it is interesting to see, um, you know, how much, you know, moving forward. You imagine some of this will just remain, right? It's just, it's just the easier way to, to do business. Um, so maybe let's talk a, a little bit about measurement. So you know, it's always there's always the right balance between branding and direct response over, you know, the sort of, you know, upper funnel, lower funnel, mid funnel, uh, you know, and so just, I, if you could talk a little bit about how you, how you look at those uh, places in the buying cycle and just uh, how the, then you measure and to prove that your marketing is working. So, so look, just like so many brands and, and marketing leaders out there, we're trying to figure out how to right size and balance the, the, the shift of so much of your media money going to that ROAS based, mid-funnel, conversion-oriented, last touch attribution, uh, media execution, right? And, and that's, a, that's a heavy lift for a lot of, lot of marketers because it's very clear to be able to show to somebody who's a decision maker in the budgeting process, yeah, give me this and I can give you a ROAS of this, right? And, and at this level, it's profitable. But what you have to continue to show though is all of the, all of the work that goes into making that ROAS possible. So, so one of the things that we're moving towards more than ever is being able to clearly articulate in connection to our corporate strategy. Like if we're, we're, we are charged to build awareness and relevance with two new consumer segments. So in order to do that, we're going to have to invest in upper funnel media and storytelling to really start to generate that connection, emotional connection, as well as just who in the heck is Carhartt? What are they all about? What do they stand for? You know, before we can convince somebody to even consider us and then purchase us. So, so we're very focused now on, okay, we're going to be able to measure, you know, this type of work, these investments on awareness and relevance against these segments that, that are definitely identified in our strategy. And then at that mid funnel section, you know, that's, that's the area we know we have to keep filling for it to remain a high row as, but I think like so many of us out there, and if anybody out there has all the answers and I, I have to be careful because somebody will definitely want to sell me the solution probably too. But, you know, there's certainly that balance of search versus all the other forms right of that mid funnel. And we recognize that, look, when a, a consumer is searching for your brand, clearly something triggered it, right? And, and one, of, one of the things we're all trying to search for is, okay, what are those key triggers that we can start to do more of that are going to generate that search that's going to lead to that conversion. But in that mid funnel area, that's really where we, we spend a lot of focus on our digital direct response forms of media in, in absolute support of our business units. You know, those business units that I shared with you earlier. And that's, and that's the role of those marketing dollars. Yeah, you've got to be able to convert that awareness and relevance into a sale. And then below that though, you know, an area that we've, you know, we haven't always labeled it this, but we're shifting it in that direction, which is loyalty, which is, it's not, it's not our loyalty program because we have that, but we're saying we do a lot of what we call, you know, lean in or, you know, um, always on forms of storytelling. 
And really the purpose of it has always been the folks that love the brand or who are part of the brand, we want to continue to give them more reasons to come back to the brand and it not be a promotion or an offer or just a selling them a new product. We want to also continue to engage with them through the stories, the consumers, the, the actions of the company and our employees as well. And, diff and different things that we all celebrate together. So, so that's, that's what we have down there in that loyalty portion. And that we're able to measure through our first party data as well. You know, we get the sentiment ratings and all of the overall, you know, feedback, you know, uh, response loops and engagement ratings as well that be help us better understand, you know, the real impact of that work. Yeah, and oh, it's interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, and when you think about it, what all of us are trying to do though is right size it, right? Because like a funnel in awareness, that should really be where a lot of your media spend is. And then the conversion is the next. And then that loyalty would be a smaller section of it because it's a smaller sized audience. Um, but I think a lot of us, we're finding ourselves like it, it's starting, you know, it looks more, you know, like, you know, the top of it is, isn't the hourglass you'd like it to be. I mean, the hourglass bubble is kind of in that middle. And so what we've all had a lot of work to do, and we're continuing this, is we've got to right size it. We've got to balance it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's something you, you mentioned the middle a lot, which I, I, I guess that's, that's the, we call it the movable middle. Uh, because that's the, the sort of segment of the population that's actually could be influenced by your marketing. Because they sort of, if you think about it, it, if they're lower funnel, they're on your website, they're already a, a loyal customer. Why spend a ton of marketing on them if they were going to go in and purchase the products anyway, right? That doesn't necessarily yeah. make sense. Uh, but what ends up happening, I think, you know, we find is that uh, paid search would get a lot of the credit, right? When you're looking at last touch. Uh, but there was, but what if you were to remove TV or remove, uh, you know, all the other branding or everything else you do, suddenly the paid search wouldn't work as well. So, uh, there, is, there is that, you know, um, a, a, and there's that sort of the sense of incrementality, right? Return, like, well, how do I, what is the incremental impact, uh, my marketing is actually having? And, and I imagine you, I mean, you must've seen this as well. We've had a lot of customers that, I don't know if they're a big box retailer, um, they, they might have some analytics that tells them they're, they're, they did a great job in marketing this year. Uh, but what, but they know that in fact, you know, their marketing performed well because people were hoarding t toilet paper and they were just running and buying everything and it had nothing to do with the marketing. Uh, and so, you know, how do you, it's, it's understanding sort of, and I, I clearly, you under, you get this, right. It's understanding the relationship between all these investments and frankly, like, things like the economy and the weather and macroeconomic events like we've experienced and that of course you know together in combination uh is what uh is, is really i guess essentially how you would measure uh yeah. your, your marketing um yeah so we 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 know those uh we know those big triggers uh i mean uh, look i mean recent over the last three early over the last year stimulus checks stimulus right. checks are a massive trigger for retail massive we see it the moment they start to deposit into bank accounts. Uh, we see it in traffic. We see it in online traffic to the website and start to see it in sales as well. So there's no doubt. I mean, we, you know, and that never, that, that was a variable that didn't exist right before the pandemic, but, right. but you used to look at like uh, tax return season, tax return season was also a good trigger. You know, of course, everybody has holiday triggers that they track and that they monitor. Um, but I mean, you started to see these new variables pop up. But weather was weather and economy were always huge drivers for Carhartt. I mean, obviously, we're a brand that's built to work out, outfit people who are working really hard at jobs. The more jobs they have, the more they're working, the more gear they need because they start to wear it out more often. The colder it gets, the more layers they need to layer up on. They're working outside. They don't have the benefit of going in an office, you know, to do right. their job most of the time. So right, no, that is interesting, and I, I'm curious the stimulus checks. That is, that is interesting. It's not something I thought of. Is it, do you think? I mean, I must. I, well, I'm waiting for a company like you guys to be come out with a report to be like, you know, hey, look at look at this uh, economic impact of immediate uh, consumer, you know, purchasing power. Yeah, yeah. Because because literally, I'm not here to say that everyone's using it for that. A lot of people are using it to pay credit card debts and and rent. Right. And, right. You know, and they're buying food at grocery stores too. Um, but there is no doubt it it has a direct correlation. We yeah, I, 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 I'm sure. I, I'm curious. I mean, it must have a correlation for all retail, and um, but I'm, I'm curious if your business in particular, for some reason, would have the demographic, the segment. I'm just curious, curious if you found that perhaps at Carhartt there was it was more sensitive 
uh, uh, to demand uh, based on a stimulus check? Well, you know, we we've never had any other variable to measure it against. I can right. tell you this: we're gonna have to figure it out next year, right? So you're gonna, we're gonna have these blips, and yeah. we're and we're gonna have blips ahead of us in the year in, in the months ahead, right? And we're gonna have to say, okay, last year at this time was when a stimulus check landed. They're not getting it this time around necessarily, right? So, you know, what will that delta look like um, as a result of the consumer not having this disposable income suddenly, you know, available to them to allow them to buy what they're looking for? So, yeah, right. no, we, we likely, yeah, there's no doubt when you th correlate, you know, the, the average income, you know, of a blue collar working class American, right, in today's world, blue collar is an old term, obviously, but when you think about the working class and, and that middle class household, you know, they're the ones that are largely, um, you know, receiving these, uh, these checks, these payments, right. for right. good reason, yeah. for very good reason. I mean, they're, 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 most of them are most at need, but, but obviously that's a new variable for us and something that you don't plan in, into your business. You right. Know? But that, I guess that would explain if the, your core audience is the one who's receiving the checks uh, and they're using it. Um, yeah, it, it makes sense that that would, that would have an impact on all businesses, but it might have a stronger impact on your business. And certainly you're going to want to understand uh, so when certain marketing campaigns were running and there was suddenly an increase in sales, well, how much of it was because we did a great job as marketers uh, and how much was it just because our customers had some more money and they, they you know, their clothes were, they needed refreshing. So they they, went yeah. out and they, they bought some new clothes. So yeah, those are definitely, uh, it, it's interesting. They can impact everyone, but certainly uh, different advertisers, you know, different marketers are going to be impacted. Well, it's it's one it's it's like the old saying. I mean, I mean, it just because it, they they chose us with something we didn't control, we we had to do a lot of work to be the brand they still chose, right? So that's a good like, point. Like we still say when it's cold out, they have a lot of choices to buy other products besides Carhartt, but we've always been able to carry connect cold weather and Carhartt sales. But the next question you always have to ask yourself is, well, why are they choosing Carhartt, right? And then what do we need to do to always make sure that when the weather is in our favor? They continue to do that, yeah. and that's an investment that we've been making for a long time, and we're going to continue to do that both in the way we build the product, but also in the way that we tell the stories and feature it. So. Right, and that's I imagine it's going to influence long-term thinking. Right, again, it's not just all lower funnel. Right, it's also it, I guess there's that movable middle, but it's also how do we keep the brand fresh, people thinking of us, so that when they have a stimulus, a new job, there, there's something that they do that they're going to spend those dollars. Yeah, you know, for and and look, we have. I'd be remiss in saying I work for a privately owned, family owned company. The founding family still owns Carhartt. So we right. have the benefit of a long term view and, uh, and an owner and CEO that really cares about the long term view. And we've been able to build and grow and, and really, you know, develop a, a, a much significantly higher awareness because of that long term view over time. Oh, that's interesting. Are there certain channels, by the way, that are preferred over others? I mean, along those lines, do you do a lot of branding versus direct response? Are they just you know, understanding your mix and how, how you're communicating with those customers. Yeah, well, I would say over the last, uh, you know, I've been with Card now, this is my 11th year. So the first three to four years, we were doing a lot of heavy brand building to really start to develop the, the, the brand dimension um, mm -hmm. and, and start to broaden in the depth and reach of the consumer audience as well. Still wasn't, you know, look, it, it wasn't on a stage of a Levi's, right? I mean, Levi's is in the high 90s. Um, but what we were really trying to do is broaden and deepen the awareness really of our audiences that were our, our, our primary target audience because cart was still recognized just for being an outerwear winter weather brand right so we broaden the depth and perspective of the consumer to think about carhartt year round and become a year-round relevant brand we've been able to do that and we've we then invested into more i would say we shifted probably too much into that dr that middle funnel that movable middle we shifted a lot there. We're now at a point in time where we have to reinvest in that awareness end for the, again, to continue to build the long-term awareness and relevance of the brand for future generations. Because we, you know, it's easy to say when you're 132 years old, you know, you don't reach 132 years without continuing to appeal to each new generation, you know, that, right. that would reach for your brand and product. So we're, we're focused on that right now. Well, and it's great. And it's, it's amazing over that period of time, you see a lot of fashion sort of brands or whatever it might be sort of go in and out of, of style, so to speak, that seems like you, you 
you have that core audience that continues to grow, uh, and it, which is you know real great testament to the work you're doing. Uh, you, I mean, we also earlier when we spoke, you mentioned that it was sort of you know that that it's not just managed, it's not just outdoor work. I mean, the de the demographic is shifting, so I'm just uh, curious how that is uh, manifesting itself today. Absolutely. Well, you know, we we're always going to build and solve for you know rugged outdoor work. Uh, you know, primary indoor work as well, but rugged outdoor work is the primary place we solve for it. Our focus right now, though, is to say, okay, how do we help more people understand the value of product that's built for that? Because, you know, our, our simple saying is, do you want a product that was built for an out uh, for a workwear site that can work really well on an outdoor hike? Or do you just want a product that you can only wear hiking and you'd never absolutely ever do anything else in your yard or if you had any DIY projects in that product as well? Right. So, so just in simple terms, our job isn't to leave work where our job is to help pe more people understand the value of it because the folks that have been wearing car for a long time, they've been doing this forever. They right. buy car and they wear it job to passion plays in the outdoors to going out to dinner with friends and family, you know, depending right. on, and they have versions of car. The old car herd is on the job the you know, to outdoors and the newer car, they break in wearing it to family gatherings and events. So, yeah, excellent. And, and what about women? I mean, is that uh... oh, women? Women, it's one of the fastest growing segments of our business today. And we're absolutely committed to investing in that, that growth uh, ongoing. And uh, we've been really featuring and telling stories around the, the amazing women who wear Carhartt for about the last five years now. And we're going to continue to build upon that as, as yeah. well. We're going to accelerate that, that consumer audience. Okay, that's excellent. Well, obviously, there's, there's a huge additional population there to grow. So, <laughs> hey, and they look the women we're, we we meet and work with along the way. I mean, I, I know they have a video from our Guinness campaign that we did recently, and yeah, and we feature an amazing woman in that that video and our story that we told around built me you know make your own parade that we partnered with Guinness on because we felt like people needed a an uplifting message and story too. You know, coming into February and March, two very dark months uh you know that during this time of year so so this will give you a good idea of how we've been featuring women if you have a second to to roll this 60. yeah can you believe it it's almost the 17th again This year may feel a little different, but last I checked, it's still St. Paddy's Day. Flags will be flying. There'll be plenty of luck to go around. And the spirit of St. Paddy's will be as strong as ever. So grab a pint and throw on your Guinness and Carhartt gear. Make your own parade this year. Happy St. Paddy's Day from Guinness and Carhartt. Uh, that, that's fantastic. So, you know, clearly, um, you know, you're a powerful brand, powerful demo, great first party data. And I know I've heard analogies of people saying uh, data is the new oil, right? Especially when you have, um, uh, you have walled gardens and cookies are going away. And so suddenly you, I mean, you have retailers that are developing media businesses because of the data they have. And so it's interesting to see this partnership that you just did with Guinness and obviously they're leveraging. So can maybe a little talk about how are you leveraging the power of that relationship you have with that core demo uh, for you know other types of partnerships. Oh, are you on mute? You're on mute, Tony. Good catch. The age old, I'm on mute. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that'll get old. You know, I can't wait for the day we don't have to worry about that anymore. Right. Um, so Guinness has been a great partner. And, you know, they were, you know, a brand that we wanted to partner with because they're, they're actually double our age. They're, I think, 265 years old. And uh, phenomenal story. Absolutely impressive what they're all about and what they say and do. And uh, so we felt just, a, you know, a, a kinship. And, uh, you know, celebrating St. Patty's Day is an uh, you know, awesome opportunity for us to do in partnership with them. And when we think about our audiences and it really, I mean, based on our first party data, 
it rings really true. You know, we see the audiences respond to it exactly how we'd like to with those, you know, we, we call them our tried and trues, you know, um, yep. and they, they absolutely respond in a big way uh, to the storytelling. And we had a collection of product and it, I, I'm pretty sure it's completely sold out. If you can find a size or two, you might be lucky. Right, but right. It's, been, it's been pretty slim uh, for the last like two to three weeks. Okay. Yeah, got it. But, uh, I mean, we, but that's the value of them, you know, really, how can we, you know, that's one of those in the loyalty spectrum. How can we really re-engage, reconnect in a meaningful way, in a positive way yeah. uh, as well in a, in a time of year when it's, it's just not a, Feb March isn't, unless you're, unless you're down South, maybe. Right. Uh, it's yeah, tough. I, it's tough I, I, <laughs> well, this year it was snowing in Texas, uh, you know, it was, it's been an unusual year on many levels. Uh, so yeah, I, I, along those lines with, with certainly loyalty and data, um, how do you, I mean, certainly people, you're collecting a lot of data, but people, of course, they move, they, they change their name, they have multiple email addresses, so they're communicating with you in many ways, coming to the store, ordering online, so just maybe talk to, how do you sort of, from an omni-channel strategy, how do you sort of keep all that fresh? Uh, and so that when you're engaging with them, that you're engaging with them, that you, that you know who you're engaging with and you're engaging with them in the right way. So uh, when you say like, are you talking about our data fresh? Is that what you're Yeah, about? just in general, like you're having online data, offline data, you know, things, you know, cookies expire, people, even the offline data, people move, they change their name, uh, they change their phone number. They, and so just, you know, you know, what, since your first party data is so powerful to you, for you, like how do you make sure that you're actually leveraging it, that it's that's actually accurate and and uh, up to date, and that it's you you know you know who your customer is across these different channels. Yeah, well, I, I really it comes down to a great collaboration partnership with our data science team, mm -hmm. and the dashboard they developed called uh, you know we call it Cart Canvas, and it yeah. really gives us a very clear view into the audiences. I can go there now and I can get a read on who was shopping us yesterday. Right. and how that breaks down and compare and contrast it by style of product. Or if you want to see a color, who was buying all, all of our pocket t-shirts in color red, you know, we can get <laughs> by the psychographics. I'm not going to get it by Eric Weiss in your home address, right? We're, right. we're very focused on that privacy aspect of it, of course, right. for everybody. But I can really get a clear sense and a clear picture. If we have a day where our numbers are off the charts, we can go in there the next day and be like, who, who, who was this? Who's visiting? Right. Who's responding? And then, of course, we can connect it to the channels of media, right? Because we have the ability to, of course, understand how they're how we're connecting with them, or in driving them towards our our website or in towards our stores, you know, as well. Now, the challenge we have though is we're not a pure D to C business, right? So right. as we talked about, we have multiple business units. Right. So what we get is we get that sample set that gives us a good read on the consumer visiting us. But one of the things that that we really value now, and and, the, and obviously the pandemic supercharged this, is more people than ever coming directly to brands, not always to buy, but they're certainly doing a lot of research, and they're certainly doing a lot of you know deep diving into the different product catalog elements. So so we have that benefit as well for us in the sense that we definitely know the traffic is up, conversions up too, but traffic is up to such levels that people are doing the research before they choose or look for Carhartt out at stores. And we have that on our website. We can help you find our product at retail stores as well that aren't just car owned and operated. Right. Uh, excellent. So you're communicating them on many levels. Uh, and uh, okay, great. So we, we do have uh, one question that came in uh, and about uh, demos uh, and, and needing the, to build you know, the brand again is the presence. Uh, the question was about CTV. Uh, so maybe just a little bit of the, you know, we can make it broader about the marketing mix in general. Have you found like certain channels? Are you experimenting or certain performing better? And how are you measuring it? Uh, that would be helpful. So, well, we're just, we're just kicking off this focus on that awareness now. Uh, again, you know, a newfound, because I'll be, I'll be transparent. I don't know, you know, maybe a few retailers were able to build awareness in 2020, but a lot of folks were focused on other things in 2020. Right. Uh, so as we're exploring it right now, I have a meeting actually after this with our media team to go through their 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 initial media plans on what the mix will look like. Uh, a lot of the buying that we do, we've been largely digital and over the top TV uh, for probably four and a half to five years. We shifted away from, you know, uh, you know, just uh, uh, basic, you know, regular television and cable quite a while ago. We just found that 
given our spending levels and really what we were trying to accomplish, it, it didn't really match up that well with what we were trying to do. So we're, we're obviously exploring though, now that everyone's cut the cord, it seems more than ever, you know, what does that connected TV look like and what will uh, the mix? And that's what I'm looking forward to seeing actually later this afternoon from the media team, you know, what will that mix be? But, you know, yeah. right now I can't tell you, I know. Okay. No, but, uh, but we know the segments and we know the history of how we've been doing, you know, we have a lot of great data through our, you know, media agency that really helps us understand the folks that we're reaching to and where they are. Like we, we look at it as day parts too, because not, you know, you're not always interested in shopping or buying, you know, clothes every hour of every day. There are certain day parts too, that make a really big difference, you know, in when a person's more open or apt to receive a message or, you know, even a brand story as well. Right. Certainly that it's not just the person, it's also the context and around it and what they're reading. And certainly uh, there's so many factors uh, that influence the, the impact a, a campaign uh, could have. So, so what, you know, we have a few minutes left. What, what do you think, you know, in the lessons that you've learned, like moving into the future, but that's, you know, assuming we, you know, we get out of this uh, soon enough that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, you know, what do you see sort of the next, you know, couple of years, like where do you, where do you see the company moving? Absolutely. Well, look, I, you know, we are, we're really focused on those two pivotal areas of removing friction. You know, it's, we have to continue to find ways to help people shop on their terms. So many of us as brands are focused on convincing someone to shop on our terms. And yet the power is in a consumer's hand. It's in the mobile device they own and operate. So we're working our tails off. We have teams working harder than ever on continuously finding ways to take out that friction. And, and that is going to be in three years, like I hope in three years, you'll be able to see Carhartt as one of the easiest to purchase apparel brands, you know, out there, you know, not, you know, and, and that then and I don't, and I don't mean that by over distribution. I mean that from just a, a truly embracing the way consumers expect and need to shop from brands. And then, you know, the other aspect of it is, uh, women, women, and uh, these these basically these next generation consumer targets that we have, there, you know, we are we're very bullish and we're very committed to building this brand with those audiences um, to make sure that we're outfitting them for the work and the lifestyles they're going to lead into the future, uh, to make sure that we're part of the group that's going to build a better world of tomorrow, because building a better world together with hardworking people is our purpose, and that's that's so that's. And that's something we'll be tracking and measuring. I don't have a yeah. three-year target yet, yeah, but, I'll, yeah. but, but, I'll, but I'll have a three-year target in about six to nine months. So. Yeah, excellent. Well, I mean, that, that's a, a great summary. I mean, it, it, you know, it sounds like to me, you know, you're obviously, you're connecting, you're, you're connecting in multiple channels. You're engaging with your customers. You're building your brand. You're recognizing the lower touch uh, things, but what for what they are, you're focusing on the movable middle and where you can actually influencing while keeping an eye on, on the strategy of, uh, you know, how do we continue to build our brands so that people think of us? Uh, so even when they get, when they have money in their pockets, they're going to come uh, purchase from you. And, and obviously you're measuring all those different uh, touch points those different segments uh, and then those different parts of the, the sales cycle. So, uh, so well done. So thank you. So it's been really great uh, having this conversation with you. And uh, uh, Emily, why don't I uh, give it back to you? Yeah, thank you guys so much. I have to say the the Carhartt brand is definitely growing for the female segment. I, many of my friends have, especially the beanies, everyone oh, yeah. has a Carhartt beanie. So um, you guys are doing a great job in growing that segment. But thank you both so much for being here. Um, and we